So this is introduction to plans and counter plans. Y'all all in the right place. Sounds like it. So, uh, who here, I guess, raise your hand if you're in entirely unfamiliar or this is brand new to you, discussing plans and counter plans. Anybody? All right, so everyone has like, some amount of background knowledge. That's good. Um, let's begin. I'll start with plans, then I'll move on to counter plans. So, a plan refers to any time that uh, you, as the affirmative, are specifying your advocacy. I guess. Presumptively, at the very minimum, imagine you didn't say anything about what you're defending. You just you know, read your case. I think the default is just to assume that the thing you're defending is pretty much just the text of the revolution, whatever that means. But oftentimes, you know, that's not sufficient or that's not strategic for you to defend, or you think you can do something better. Uh, you think you can defend some particular thing that is an example of, or is a particular way of interpreting the resolution. You know, you don't want, say, to read your case, and the negative gets up and says, well, that's actually not what the resolution means, it means something different, and then your entire case is irrelevant. So oftentimes, you'll find the affirmative case uh, includes a specification of what they're defending. And that'll look like something like plan, and then you state the plan, uh, or something to that effect. And there's a lot of reasons to do that. Um, primarily is you're picking your own ground. You, know, you choose what area of the resolution you think is the best one to defend, and you defend that. Either that could be a subset of the resolution, so some part of it, or it could be a method of defending the resolution, so some way of implementing the resolution. Uh, I think perhaps on the upcoming topic, the universal basic income topic, one way you might do that is the app might want to specify exactly how the UBI gets funded. A lot of the negative ground, if you think about the arguments you're probably starting to crap in the negative, kind of depends on the cost of the UBI. Is it going to involve printing a bunch of new money, in which case maybe it causes inflation? Is it going to involve cutting other social services, in which case those social services being good might be a disadvantage to the universal basic income? Is it going to involve raising taxes, in which case economic harms to taxes are relevant? And so there's a lot of potential ways you could fund the UBI, and they could be better or worse. And so maybe it's the affirmative. You might want to have a plan that just doesn't necessarily narrow the debate, but just specifies the way in which the UBI is implemented. In other cases, someone might want to narrow the resolution to a particular example. So you know, the last topic that I think was pretty similar to this was the living wage, uh, just covers our part of living wage, and people specified hey, well, the, t the topic doesn't say everyone, so we'll just specify which section of the economy they're referring to. And so people would say, you know, tipped workers ought to receive a living wage, or they'll say uh, some other economic group or economic area should receive a living wage, and they'd focus it to a particular part. And usually it's advantageous uh, to you in the affirmative for at least one of two reasons. First is it might get you some specific offense that you wanted to discuss. So if all of the offense in your case say is about that area of the economy. And then obviously you want to focus the debate, or naturally would want to focus the debate on that area, so you have better offense. And then secondarily, <laughs> avoiding negative offense. That might probably be the larger of the two, in terms of what's more likely to be the stronger strategic consideration, which is if you're picking the area of the debate, the negative is going to have a slightly harder time, or sometimes a much harder time, depending on what you're picking. Um, Imagine, for example, on the, the nuclear uh, the nuclear power topic. That's weird. On the nuclear power topic from uh, last year, uh, that you specified, say, a few particular countries ought to or ought not have nuclear power. You know, that might narrow the debate in your favor in a way that could both get you ground because you think you have a particularly good reason why those countries don't have nuclear power, or could harm your opponent's ground if all their offense, say, doesn't apply to those countries. So you know, maybe your argument is, I don't know, developing countries ought to have nuclear power. And you have a particularly good reason why you know, nuclear power is something that developing countries specifically need in order to have, you know, be economically competitive. And all their ground was about you know, like established first world countries have the ability to transition to solar or wind energy. And you have evidence that that's not possible for developing countries. Something like that. So you could both gain ground, and you could also exclude your opponent's ground. So that's the basic strategic consideration behind a plan. Uh, as far as the formatting goes, you could have a, you know, a plan with any particular case. You could have a you know, value for change kitchen. wouldn't fundamentally alter the structure of the affirmative case. But the one thing that you're going to have at some point is a statement of what your advocacy is. It's beginning, towards the end, somewhere in the middle. So you want to say, my plan or advocacy or plan, plan text, and then you state your advocacy. I would say be very, very careful if there's one sentence in your case you want to go over thoroughly. It's the plan. Because if you're stating a plan, what you're saying is, this should be the focus of the debate round. And so, much like the resolution, your opponent's probably going to scrutinize it really closely. If you've constructed it quite poorly, 
or it doesn't mean quite what you think it means because you just like typed it up in a fly uh, and you know made a, a, a grammatical error that actually makes it mean something very different, you might end up losing the round because uh, your opponent knows that you don't. And if the round hinges on that particular statement, that particular statement of advocacy, then it's going to matter a lot. So I would always double, triple check your plan and make sure it means exactly what you think it means and it makes a whole lot of sense. So I would say plans, if you're affirmative, usually tend to be most conducive to utilitarian or more consequentialist cases, but that's not necessarily true. Uh, the, the reason for that is if you're a consequentialist or utilitarian, you probably care a lot about the particular details of implementation, the consequences of the bill. Uh, so imagine you know, you're debating the efficacy of the UBI and deciding whether or not it's going to cost more than it saves or whether the benefits of uh, reducing poverty outweigh the harms to the economy. That sort of calculation tends to be one that lends itself towards consequentialist or utilitarian calculus. Because a consequentialist is someone who cares primarily about the consequences. And so usually the virtue of a plan is it gets you into those nitty gritty details a little bit more. Because you're focusing on a specific method of implementation or a specific subset of the resolution. And so usually there's more strategic value to be gained if you're reading a case that cares a lot about those specific details of implementation. That could be true, or it could be not, of other frameworks. You know, if you're taking a more deontological approach, one that says, you know, there's categorical rules, and so imagine you could think of some sort of categorical deontological objection to nuclear power. You could specify a country, there's nothing wrong with that. A deontologist is going to have an opinion on what the U.S. should do about nuclear power. But if your argument was just categorically nuclear power ought to be rejected, then it's not going to matter all too much which country you specify. Your case is going to be all too different. And so usually the more broader, sweeping philosophical arguments don't hinge as much, at least, on the specification of the plan. And so that's why I'd say you'll find that most people who commonly read plans are also reading utilitarian or consequentialist cases, or some other framework that is similar in that it cares primarily about those, you know, the details and the pragmatic concerns. Now, on the negative, if you're responding to a plan, probably the primary negative argument that a plan is going to introduce that uh, you wouldn't have access to otherwise, or have much less access to otherwise, is topicality. Who here has heard topicality? All right, raise your hand if you haven't, probably. Topicality is brand new. All right, so topicality is an objection that says that plan that the affirmative picked actually is not an adequate representation of the topic. You know, let's say that the topic is the universal basic income, and the app says, my plan is uh, to ban nuclear power. You know, trivially, obviously, that's not part of the topic. You can't just pick whatever you want to defend. Um, more realistically, maybe they say, you know, my plan is to provide everyone with a universal... Um, housing voucher that provides you basically a monetary equivalent to go buy a house. And you say, well, that's kind of like income. It's kind of like the government giving you money. They're giving you cash that you can only use on houses. But that's not enough because a necessary part of the universal basic income is that it has to be you know, basically an open-ended amount of money. And if the government is only allowing you to use it for houses, it's not really universal basic income. And so maybe your objection is that affirmative they picked a plan that kind of ostensibly is similar to the topic, but it's not in the area of the topic. And so topicality is the objection that says, my opponent's advocacy is not within the resolution. And uh, I just gave a whole lecture on topicality uh, an hour ago. So there's obviously a whole lot to that, and we uh, can get into that more depth later if you're interested in topicality. I was just asking somebody during Socrates hours. But the basic gist of it is, it's a theory argument. And what you're going to be saying is, here's my interpretation of the topic. And here's why the app is not consistent with that. Um, the most basic example, I think, that shows up a lot is many resolutions, especially as of late in Lincoln Douglas, use uh, actors or agents uh, of action that uh, it's plural, but not entirely clear exactly how many it's referring to. So countries, or just governments, or individuals, uh, or I guess conceivably something like corporations. Uh, all these are examples of plural terms, but it's not always entirely clear exactly how many they're referring to. So think of the topic, you know, countries ought to prohibit the production of nuclear power. That's a topic where the agent of action is countries. Which countries? The affirmative is usually going to want to interpret that as generally as possible. Any countries. As long as some countries have a nuclear power, the app is one. The negative might want to interpret that as strictly as possible. No, you got to prove all countries. And so often, pretty frequently, there's a debate about exactly what does that mean. When you say countries ought to prohibit the production of nuclear power, and the app only says, a few countries ought to, are they affirming the resolution? Neg might say, no, you're not. And the app has to say, yes, you are. And so you'll have a topicality debate over whether the affirmative is an accurate definition of the term countries. 
And those debates usually include both considerations of what's most accurate, but also usually, kind of like other theory debates, what's most fair or educational. Which of these would be the best interpretation of the topic? Maybe it would be more fair to interpret it one way or the other. And if you have questions about that, feel free to raise your hand um, about topicality. All right? Yeah. That's just the, ver the various part note summary. Um, but in general, the biggest strategic drawback to plans is the more strategic it gets for you, the more strategic topicality gets for your opponent. Because if you're picking a really, really narrow or unpredictable plan, it's probably going to give you a huge advantage in terms of researching because you're going to be the one who knows exactly what you're defending and your opponent might not have predicted it. And they're probably going to have much worse ground because naturally you're going to pick the better areas of the topic. You're not going to pick like the worst conceivable example of the resolution and defend it. But the more the extent to which you do that, usually the better the objection is going to be that that's not a, an area of the topic. The negative is going to say, well, hey, if that's a really, really undebatable or really, really unpredictable portion of the topic, then obviously you shouldn't be able to specify just that. So the more specific and narrow your plan gets, usually the better the topicality of objection to it is going to get. Um, like imagine the after said one particular country ought to ban nuclear power. It's probably a pretty strong objection that obviously countries doesn't mean a singular country. Um, yes? So if someone were to bring up something that's not topical, mm -hmm. how would you respond to that like in round? Would you just say in your uh, speech like their argument isn't topical? That's a good question. Like do you just discount it? So um, basically, you present it like any other theory argument. If you ever, you see an interpretation violation standard than a voting issue, you know, it look a lot like that. You have interpretation, but unlike other theory interpretations, usually topicality shows don't have a definition along with it because you have to show which word or words or phrase of the topic do you think they're not being consistent with. And the example I just gave is probably countries, right? And other examples might be something different. So you're going to say, here's my interpretation of what that portion of the topic means. Here's why they violate or in, or or are inconsistent with that. Here's the reasons why this is a good interpretation of the topic, and here's why it's a reason that the judge should vote. And that would be a separate position that you would run. And that could be anywhere from like 45 seconds to four minutes, maybe, if you, like, if you really knew you know their ground and you really knew they are on topical. Um, and so that's, I would say, probably what you're likely to see. And then as the affirmative, you just kind of want to respond to each of those. Um, like I said, th there's a whole lot of depth to that. It's a whole hour lecture on structuring and responding to topicality. Um, but that's the, the basic version. Other questions related to that? Okay. Um, other questions related to plans before I move on. So, can you think of a topic recently or coming up where you have an example of a plan you think might be strategic? Or a topic where you thought plans were strategic or could have been strategic? We were debated last year, the topic last year. Okay, for most of you. Who you debated the um, the qualified immunity topic? Okay. I think this is an example of where uh, the topic kind of lent itself a little bit more to affirmative plans than others. Because it just said, the United States ought to limit qualified immunity and uh, or for police officers. And um, limit is kind of an open-ended term that gives the act a bit of leeway to explain exactly how it ought to be limited. If you prove you should limit it in X way or in Y way, either way the resolution would be true. And so it seemed like it was arguably pretty strategic for the affirmative to be able to say exactly how we should limit qualified immunity for police officers. So you can imagine better or worse ways. You know, maybe you could just get rid of the concept entirely. Some people defended that. But if you're the affirmative, you know, you know that although you're going to have good ground there, you're also going to be walking into the best negative ground. And so maybe you want to find sort of a more reasonable middle ground solution that kind of limits it but also kind of maintains qualified immunity. And so that topic gave a, a pretty good example of one where there's room for specification of how do you plan on limiting qualified immunity. And there are different solutions, and some people read different advocacies. And also, it was one of those topics where the wording of the resolution was a little, more, uh, a little bit more naturally conducive to it. Um, you know, it seemed pretty clear that if it just says ah, the United States should limit qualified immunity to police officers, that any example of limitation, that is, I guess is a, a noticeable limitation, would logically affirm that statement. And so, Usually the topicality objections, I think, are a little bit weaker on that topic. Now, I would say there's some debaters um, in some schools, usually, that are kind of looking to read plans regardless of the topic, just because uh, you know, that's their preferred method of debate, or that's the style they're used to, et cetera. And they're going to try to find one on any topic. And uh, so you should be prepared regardless. But there's many topics where uh, the plans are a little bit more tenuous. Um, you know, like the, the countries ought to prohibit nuclear 
our topic. That, that topic seemed a little bit stark. You know, countries obviously doesn't mean just one country. And prohibit obviously doesn't mean, like, just regulate a little, a little bit. Prohibit seems like a much stronger word than limit. Or um, what's the operative term in the, the free speech topic that made it a little bit strict and hard to specify? Anyone remember? Anyone? Yeah. Hate speech? Well, think about a term in the resolution. Because remember, the affirmative has to defend the resolution. So when the negative is reading topicality, they want to find a term in the resolution that uh, the act is violating. I think restrict is a little bit open-ended. I don't think that hindered the act too much. Right? Restrict is kind of like limit. And you can restrict it in a number of ways. What came right after that? So that, that was another topic I had to debate. I'd say it's a valid answer. But yeah, like say that again? Well, right before that. Yeah, any. Right? The topic says, public policy universe since ought not restrict any constitutionally protected speech. That sounds like a pretty strong statement, one that uh, you can't just be like, yeah, you don't restrict some and not others. And so some of the best topicality objections in that topic, if they have to specify, were, well, you specified some, but the topic says you can't restrict any protected speech. And so that was probably the main word in that topic that you had to get around. Alternatively, if you were specifying a college or university, obviously, public college or university was also relevant to the topicality debate. Other questions about plans? All right. I'll move on to counterplans then. So uh, counterplan can come up, I think, regardless of whether or not the affirmative has defended a specific plan. Because a counterplan is just an alternative course of action. And even if you haven't defended a plan, on most resolutions, there's some exception, although most of the ones recently uh, wouldn't, uh, be, this wouldn't be true of. On most resolutions, the resolution itself is already a proposed course of action. Think about the current one. The United States ought to provide a universal, universal basic income. Even if you're not defending a plan, and you haven't specified, You've defended a course of action. You said, this government ought to do this policy, basic income. And so that is a course of action. So the negative could have an alternative course of action, i.e. a counterplan. On the public colleges and universities topic, you've got an agent of action, public colleges and universities, taking an action, choosing not to restrict free speech. On the nuclear power topic or the qualified immunity topic, you've got countries, or the United States, doing something, prohibiting nuclear power, or limiting qualified immunity. On every one of those, you've got the possibility of doing one thing or a host of other things. Maybe instead of prohibiting nuclear power, we limit nuclear power in some way but allow it to be used in certain circumstances. Maybe we develop a new type of reactor and so on. Maybe instead of universal basic income, what's something else we might do? Yeah, maybe instead of a universal basic income, we impose a living wage. Maybe we have... Uh, an expansion of current social services or their earned income tax credit, etc. And so a counter plan is just the negative proposing an alternative to the affirmative's plan uh, or to the resolution itself, right? Even if the affirmative is not defending a plan, you're still defending something. You're affirming the resolution, you're affirming that course of action. And so logically, a counter plan is going to be relevant. And um, I've always heard some people you know, say something towards the effect of, well, the AF defends the resolution, and the resolution proposes a course of action. But there's no negative resolution. So why does the negative get to have an advocacy? That seems like a, a valid or intuitive question that needs to be answered. Why does the negative get to have an advocacy? Or do they? Anyone have an opinion on that? Nobody has any opinion whatsoever? It's surely like somebody ought to be. Come on. I know it's early. Is it valid for the negative to choose an alternative course of action rather than just defending the status quo? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I think that's a good answer. I think he's getting the right thing, which is a negative can have an alternative advocacy, not because they just get to like pick whatever they want and defend it, but because their job is to disprove the resolution, and proposing a better course of action does disprove the resolution. At the end of the day, the negative wins, not because their advocacy is good, but because it proves the resolution is bad. And this is important. This is not true of the F. The F has an advocacy, the resolution. And the, the nature of the affirmative is just to affirm that advocacy. The act does win if their advocacy is good, and they lose if their advocacy is bad. The debate is not centered on the negative advocacy, it's centered on the affirmative advocacy. So the act just has to prove that advocacy is good. The negative has an additional burden, an additional, uh, if you're proposing an alternative course of action, which is, if you think that advocacy is good, 
What else do you have to prove about the advocacy in order for it to be a reason to vote negative? Uh, can't coincide with your advocacy. Yeah, exactly. Which is that not only is your advocacy good, but it proves the app advocacy is bad. We should do that instead of the resolution, instead of in addition to the resolution. Imagine that weren't true. Imagine uh, the negative could just pick any advocacy they wanted and just defend that, and if they won the advocacy was good, they would win. That actually kind of naturally lead to really terrible debates. Think of the best policy that, that you could conceive of. Um, raise your hand if you have a, a policy that you think would like, what's the single best policy you would pass if you just had one free law that you could make? Imagine you're president for like an hour, and you, you, you can lobby for one bill, and you know you can get it passed. What would you do? Anything? The most obviously good bill that you think you could pass. Not one of you has any ideas? Yeah, imagine you're, you're president for an hour, and you, you have the ability to get one bill passed. You can pick any law you want. What's the best bill? Come on. I have to have some idea of some law that's a good thing. I'll have debaters. All right, so fixing public schools and education by redistributing the money. That seems like a, a pretty valid answer. Obviously, public schools could stand to improve. So imagine you think that's the best bill. Whatever it is, you know. What's your name again? Pranathi? Am I pronouncing that right? So Pranathi, you know, she knows that regardless of what the topic is, she's going to walk in when she's negative. She says, you've got a good plan, but I've got an even better plan. Redistribute money for public schools. And she knows that, well, that's the best policy. There's a lot of good evidence for it, no evidence against it. So she knows she can always win that her counter plan is really good and it's even better than the affirmative case. Is that a good strategy on any given topic? Yes? No? What did you say? Why not? So it is better than any other resolution. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Really? No. What did you just say a second ago? What else? What does she have to prove about it? Oh, it can't. Oh, it can't happen with the other one. Right. Exactly. So you say, "Hey, I'm affirmative, and I'm affirming a universal basic income," or "I'm affirmative, and I'm affirming limiting qualified immunity for police officers." And she's like, "Well, instead of that, we should fix education." You're gonna say, "Well, uh, you can't do both. You, you, can, you do can, both. Do both. can do both. You can do both. Yeah, you're, you're affirmative. Okay. You're gonna be like, "Yeah, well, why don't I just do both of those?" Okay. You're gonna say. As the affirmative, I'm still affirming the resolution. Qualified immunity is still a good idea. You haven't proven it's a bad idea. We okay. could limit qualified immunity for police officers and also fix education. We could ban nuclear power and fix education. We could provide a universal basic income and do the same education reforms that she's talking about. And so, in this case, uh, I think it kind of illustrates the problem with the or the difference between the affirmative and the negative and the function of their advocacy, which is the negative doesn't win for their advocacy being good. The F could agree with the negative that their advocacy is good as long as they show the AF advocacy is also a good idea. And so when you're negative, you have the burden to prove competition, which is you have to prove that your advocacy is competitive with the affirmative advocacy. And so that's ultimately the function of a counterplan. It's not the, the thing you pick and you're like, all right, now if I win this right, I win, if I win that this thing is good, I win the round. Because you're still debating the resolution. Even if you propose a counterplan on the negative or have an alternative course of action, ultimately what you're trying to do is use it as a tool to disprove the resolution, to negate the resolution. And so as the negative, you have to show competition that that advocacy in some way competes with the affirmative advocacy. And it could do that in one of two ways. It could either be mutually exclusive, which means there's just no way you could do both, or it could be net beneficial, which means you could do both, but it'd be better just to do the counter plan alone. So imagine the affirmative plan is, let's go to McDonald's for lunch. And the counter plan is, let's go to, uh, name your favorite restaurant? Chipotle. And so he says, counter plan, let's go to Chipotle. Uh, and he says, McDonald's is, you know, food, it's all right, but Chipotle tastes better. And uh, that's his, his counter plan. It could be mutually exclusive, but there's just no way we could do both. He says, well, McDonald's is that way, Chipotle is the exact opposite direction, and we just don't have enough time to get all the way to McDonald's and then to Chipotle and then back to campus and still make it to lab. So he says there's no way we can do both. 
And if that's true, you have to pick one. You're going to have to either go to McDonald's or to Chipotle. And so there, the counterpoint is naturally going to compete. You're going to say, well, if we can only do one, which one's better? And then any reason Chipotle is good becomes a reason not to go to McDonald's. Because if we go to McDonald's, we're missing out on all those benefits of Chipotle. Now, alternatively, you could say, well, maybe it's possible to do both, but we shouldn't. Maybe Chipotle and McDonald's are in the same parking lot, and we could go to both of those. But you say, well, if we went to both, it would take, you know, cost more money. Um, and also, maybe McDonald's is bad. McDonald's is smelly, and I don't like the bathrooms. And so, if we go to both, I have to walk into McDonald's, and that grosses me up. And so, it would be better just to go to Chipotle and get the good food, and not stop at McDonald's, even if, like, kind of want fries. Maybe, like, the benefit of getting those fries as well is just not worth the additional cost of taking a little extra time to walk over to this kind of McDonald's. Make sense? So the negative burden is to prove competition. And the reason you're proving competition is because you're trying to show an opportunity cost. An opportunity cost is just a cost to doing the affirmative, not in terms of the, the money that you're spending or like the lives that are lost, but it's in terms of the lost opportunity. So the, basically the cost of the affirmative is what's the next best thing you're missing out on doing? And the counter plan is an opportunity cost. You're missing out on doing this counter plan that you think is a better idea. So as the affirmative, what's the term? Anyone know the, the, the debate-related term that you would use to challenge competition? Yeah, the permutation. If anyone you know, has studied this in mathematics, you might have learned this in high school or maybe middle school. A permutation in mathematics just refers to some combination of things, one of which you know, the order of things matters. Uh, and so in debate jargon, that means the combination of the plan and the counter plan. Maybe we do both of them, maybe we do the affirmative and then we do the counter plan, et cetera. But the permutation or perm is just a reference to do both the affirmative and the negative advocacies. And so the permutation is the challenge uh, that, what's your name in the front? Rishi, Rishi was just making uh, a second ago, which is why not do both? They could coincide. And so if you're the affirmative and you're debating this counter plan, your argument is going to be, let's do the affirmative and also the negative. And the reason that you win if you win the permutation and you're the affirmative is because the debate is over the affirmative advocacy. If your advocacy is a good idea, you've proven the resolution. It doesn't matter what the negative advocacy is good too. So in this case, with the McDonald's and Chipotle, we say, yeah, let's go to McDonald's and Chipotle. You really like burritos, but I really like hamburgers. And so it'd be great if both of us, uh, we, just, we, we went to both, so we each get what we like the best. And um, I like hamburgers so much that tolerating the smell is worth it, right? Everyone's following that? Okay. So in addition to a counter, uh, in addition to a competition, a counter plan has a few other components. Firstly, the counter plan has a text, much like a plan has a text. You're going to need to state what your counter plan is. Much like the plan text, you probably want to be careful about how you word it because it's going to be the thing that defines what your advocacy is. So you're going to say text or the counter plan text or something to that effect, and you're going to state what the advocacy is. Then it has competition. You don't always need to explicitly justify the competition. Sometimes it's kind of obvious. But bear in mind that at least implicitly, the counter plan always needs to be competitive. Sometimes the counter plan, I guess, is questionably competitive. You're going to want to start that debate out early and point out and justify why it's competitive and explain why, say, it's usually exclusively the affirmative case. Um, thirdly, a counter plan has solvency. Solvency refers to the ability of the counter plan to solve the affirmative case. There are some rare exceptions, but probably 90 plus percent of the time, the function of a counter plan, at least in part, is to solve a portion of the affirmative case. Because if it can't fix any of the things the affirmative is fixing, it's probably not doing a whole lot for you strategically. And it's probably not something that's going to uh, compete with the affirmative. So when you're negative, you want to have a counter plan that you can prove solves portions of the affirmative harms. What's an example of a counter plan that could solve a portion of the harms that a universal basic income can solve? Anyone heard a counter plan yet on the camp topic? All right, a negative income tax. So you say, rather than just play, uh, paying a, fat, uh, a flat check of five to $1,000 to everyone, what we should do is have uh, change our income tax system so that people who are very low in the income tax bracket actually get money back. So 
functionally equivalent to universal basic income, at least for people who are low in income, but use a little bit of a different mechanism. And you maybe argue that's better. So you say, that fixes the problem because the people who still really need that money, the, uh, the people at the low end of the income bracket, are still getting a large amount of money back from the government. And so you say that solves a portion of the affirmatives. Now, next you want to say there's a net benefit. So the last section of the counter plan is there's a net benefit. And you notice, I think, that this term showed up in competition as well. There's a reason for that. The net benefit is what's better about the counter plan. So why is the counter plan beneficial relative to the affirmatives? And again, sometimes winning the net benefit is also necessary to prove competition. A counter plan that is mutually exclusive, you could never do both, whether it's desirable to or not. It would not be possible. You know, if the plan was prohibit nuclear power production, you all remember that topic, anyone who debated it, and the negative was let's build a ton of nuclear reactors, those two things just could not both be done. Obviously, you couldn't prohibit it and increase it at the same time. But many, and probably a good majority of counterplans, aren't going to be things that are just diametrically opposed to the resolution. They're going to be things that are somewhat different, but you could conceive of doing both. And this is why, for many counterplans, winning the net benefit section is also necessary to prove the competition. Because the reason why you don't do both is often just that there's a disadvantage to doing both. There's some harm to doing both of them. And that's what you're going to show in the net benefit section. So using your negative income tax example, what might be the reason a negative income tax is better than a universal basic income? Okay, so the net benefit is a universal basic income would cut a check to the wealthy, and that's a bad idea. Yeah, that's a conceivable net benefit. And I also think it illustrates uh, the point I was about to get into next. I wish I had chalk, which is uh, that there's primarily two different types of net benefit. There's an internal net benefit and an external net benefit. An internal net benefit is just a reason the counter plan is a good idea. An external net benefit is a harm to the affirmative. So reason the affirmative is a bad idea. And when you're comparing the plan versus the counter plan, both of these are net benefits. The counter plan could be better because the counter plan has something really good about it, or the counter plan could be better because the affirmative has something really bad about it. But they're relevantly different in a few strategic contexts. So if I said plan, let's go to McDonald's, and uh, someone else said counter plan, let's go to Chipotle, um, what's an example of an internal net benefit to that counter plan? Anyone? Get some Chipotle hitters. Yeah, so Chipotle's got really healthy food. I gotta get my daily intake of protein, fiber, so on, and Chipotle got all that. What's an external net benefit to the Chipotle counter plan? Anyone? An external net benefit to the Chipotle counter plan if you're debating against the McDonald's affirmative. McDonald's is super crowded. Yeah, McDonald's is super crowded. I bump into a bunch of people and they get all from my personal space. Those are both good answers. The crowdedness problem is an external net benefit because it's a problem with McDonald's. The nutrition benefit is a benefit to Chipotle. Although, that one I, I could also conceive of maybe you phrasing the opposite way, which is McDonald's is super unhealthy and that's a problem with McDonald's. And so maybe you phrase that one slightly differently. Um, but point being, internal net benefit, benefit to Chipotle, external net benefit, harm to McDonald's. And usually, Internal net benefits, I think, jive best with a counter plan that's mutually exclusive. Imagine we couldn't go to Chipotle and to McDonald's. There's no way I could get the really nutritious food. Or uh, I think for the purposes of this example, I think it helps a little bit more to think of it as tastiness. I really, really enjoy Chipotle's burritos. They taste really good for me. That's my internal net benefit. Uh, and McDonald's is just really bland. And so I say there's an internal net benefit to going to Chipotle, which is the food tastes really good, and I would like to enjoy it. And so let's go to Chipotle instead. If the counter plan and the plan are mutually exclusive, remember in that scenario where McDonald's is on the opposite side of town, we couldn't eat the both? Obviously, I'm going, to go, I'm going to go to the one that has the really good tasting food. But now, what if the counter plan and the plan are mutually exclusive? What if McDonald's uh, and Chipotle are right next to each other? And you propose going to McDonald's, and I say, well, I really like the taste of Chipotle burritos. What might you say? 
That's one response. Um, so that could work. You see McDonald's tastes good as well. That's actually not a net benefit to Chipotle because McDonald's actually also solves that problem. Um, but what's an argument that you could make um, specifically because the counter plan is only or is not mutually exclusive? Uh, say that again? Well, I'd say Chipotle bathroom is not smelling. It sounds more like an extra lab benefit because it's like you don't proactively like going to any bathroom that's not smelly. You don't visit not smelly bathrooms all the time just for the sake of it. It's probably more likely you're describing a harm to McDonald's because McDonald's bathrooms do smell and that's bad. You know? Um, but specifically, if they were next to each other and you're the affirmative, you could say, well, why not just go to both? You can get your really tasty burrito, and we can also get a McDonald's to get something good there. So if it's an internal that benefits, something good about Chipotle, then it's also going to be something good about doing both. If the affirmative is advocating the permutation, which is to do both the plan and the counter plan, or the resolution and the counter plan, if they haven't specified a plan, and your only net benefit was Chipotle is really good, or my counter plan is really good, then they're going to say, do both of those. We get all the benefits of the affirmative, and we're going to get the benefits of the negative. All those reasons you're kind of putting is good. So if it's possible to do both, oftentimes those internal net benefits are going to be a bit weaker because doing both is going to get the benefits of doing the counterplan. But now suppose it was an external net benefit, some harm to the affirmative. That's not going to be true anymore. Because if the reason you wanted to go to Chipotle was that there was something really terrible about McDonald's, let's say you recognize that their food is all made of rat meat and you don't like rat meat, then you're going to say, well, the reason we go to Chipotle is not because like, Chipotle is amazing or anything. I think it's okay. But I, I, would I want to eat, and I really don't want to eat my rat meat nuggets. And so in that scenario, the affirmative response of let's just go to both and get both types of food isn't going to be as persuasive. Because if there's a harm to McDonald's, which is you don't want to ingest rat, and there's nothing wrong with Chipotle, going to both I mean, you're going to eat some good food, but you're also going to have the, the food that's going to get you sick. The, the whatever, you know, maybe it's disease, maybe it's got, you know, rat meat, whatever. Any problem with McDonald's is going to be a problem doing both. Uh, or remember the crowdedness one. Someone suggested McDonald's really crowded. If I don't want to have to bump into people in a crowded public space, and I go to both restaurants, eventually I'm going to have to go to McDonald's, and I'm going to have that problem of being in a crowded area. So any harm to McDonald's, is going to be a reason not to do both, because doing both is going to include doing the affirmative. And so most counterplans, I think, you'll find end up looking like this, which is they're not something you necessarily couldn't possibly do alongside the affirmative. They're something you could combine, and so you need some reason not to do both. And so usually you want not just a benefit to the counterplan, an internal net benefit, but a harm to the affirmative, an external net benefit, the net benefit of the counterplan, because it's a reason not to do the affirmative. And Bear in mind, it needs to be net beneficial. So you can't identify a harm to the affirmative that also applies to the counterplan. Otherwise, there's no more reason to do the counterplan than it is to do the affirmative uh, advocacy. So you couldn't be like, I don't like McDonald's because the employees are rude, if you know that the Chipotle employees are also rude. Because otherwise, there's no reason to go to Chipotle instead of McDonald's. So when you're negative, you want to identify some harm to the affirmative which the counterplan can avoid. So... I don't know, using your living wage example. What's a problem with a universal basic income that a living wage might avoid? Anybody? Okay, maybe a universal basic income is just much, much more expensive. And so you say, the living wage can have similar effects at reducing poverty without costing nearly as much money. And that would work. And what's the problem with doing both? Anybody? In this scenario, what if I said, well, why not just do both a universal basic income and a living wage? It'd still be expensive. Yeah, exactly. Probably even more expensive. Uh, so if the problem was with the affirmative case, and I say, well, let's just include the affirmative case, you're including the thing that has the big problem with it. And so that's why usually you want to harm to the affirmative case. Now, conversely, let's say I was reading this living wage counter plan, and all I had was an interim net benefit. I said, living wage is actually super good. Because when workers get the higher wages of a living wage, they become more productive. And they, you know, 
they work more wholeheartedly at their jobs because they feel like they're a bit more respected. So I say living wage is good because it increases worker productivity. You're the affirmative, you're defending the universal basic income. And that's my only argument around. What's the easiest response? Yeah, exactly. Permutation. Do both. You'd say, all right, you identified any reason why the universal basic income is bad. You said the living wage is good and gets this benefit. So maybe you're right, and maybe I'm right. We could both be right. We could do the universal basic income, get all the benefits that I was talking about, and also get it, you know, do a living wage so that we increase worker productivity. And so in a round like that where you're you know, saying do a living wage instead of a basic income or any other policy, you're going to want a harm to the affirmative case to function as a net benefit because the harm to the affirmative case is usually going to be your answer to the permutation, which is why can't we do both? Everyone following that? Okay. So how to respond to a counterplay? Uh, we've already covered one argument, I think, in a bit of depth, which is the permutation. The permutation is a challenge to the competition of the counterplay. So you're going to say, we could do both. The counterplay does not compete with the affirmative case. And there's a lot of variations on that. We don't have time to get into all like, the nuances of the permutations. But in general, the function of permutations is to challenge the competition to say that there's some way to combine the affirmative and the negative advocacy. Secondly, you want to say the counterplan does not solve your case. Supposing the counterplan resolved 100% of the problem of the affirmative. Does it matter if the affirmative is really good and fixes a whole bunch of stuff? If the counterplan does that just as well, then you have no reason to choose the affirmative over that counterplan. There's no reason to do your app instead. And so usually what you want to say is the counterplan can't fix all the problems. You want to establish a solvency deficit that it in some way fixes it less effectively than you do. So if your advocacy is the, a universal basic income and the negative advocacy is just to expand the earning income tax a bit or the earning income tax credit a bit, a good argument you might have is, yeah, you probably got evidence that expanding the EITC could reduce poverty and establishing UBI could reduce poverty. But the UBI is probably going to have a much, much larger effect. But it's just a much more massive policy. And so you're going to say, you might fix a little of it, but not nearly as much as the affirmative. There's a big deficit between the amount the AF solves and the negative solves. So there's still a huge amount of often favor of the affirmative, because I fix it much, much better than you do. And so you want a solvency deficit. Because you need a solvency deficit in order to be able to weigh your case against theirs. You need to say, you don't fix the problems of my case, if you want to make the argument that the problems of your case are really important. So if you spend two and a half minutes of the debate round winning your case, but then don't go to the counter plan and say, you don't solve that problem, you're going to be in for a bad time. Do you have a question in the back? OK. Um, so next thing you want to do is answer the net benefit. So much like you'd answer, the, say, the contention of an affirmative case or a negative case, you want to prove the net benefit wrong. You're going to say, no, you don't solve it. The net benefit is not something the counterplan fixes. It's not important or doesn't apply to the affirmative case. And you're going to need to prove that there's not a net benefit to the counterplan, or at least reduce the net benefit enough that the affirmative case cannot weigh it. So notice that both of these are important, yes? Um, could you say that the counterplan upholds the resolution? Yeah, so that. That's another challenge. Um, you could argue, I guess, that the kind of line affirms the resolution. I'd say, in a sense, this is also a challenge to competition. And in fact, you often hear that argument framed, uh, phrased as permutation due to the counterplan, uh, which is just like a debate jargon way of asserting your counterplan actually just is the resolution or is my advocacy. And so, I don't know, I've actually seen some people who argue that the negative income tax and the universal basic income are pretty much the same thing and they should be treated as the same thing. And so, maybe you're affirmative. You're debating the universal basic income. The negative reads are negative income tax counterplan. And you cite one of these economists who say the negative income tax is just basically universal basic income done through a slightly different means under a different name. But they're actually equivalent. We should treat them the same. So actually, if you defend a negative income tax, they're just an example of a UBI. I've seen some people who say that argument and that they're similar enough to be considered the same. And then what you're suggesting is not that the counterplan is a bad idea, but it's actually just an affirmative idea. And so, yeah, that's a distinct kind of uh, example. And that does show up sometimes. That's a good point. So what would, like, the first example of a negative income tax 
well, you want to establish that they're different. So you probably want some literature from someone else who says, no, actually, the NIT and the UBI do function differently, and like that difference is important enough to consider them different policies. So uh, anything else with responding to counter plans in general? Uh, one more thing I guess worth referencing is counter plans is probably one of those areas where people are most likely to, to push the uh, rules of, I guess, acceptability in debate in terms of what, what's allowable and try to find things that are, you know, a little bit cheating. And like we were just discussing, what if the counter plan is actually questionably different from the resolution at all? Um, and so there's a lot of theory debates related to counter plans. I don't want to get too much in depth in this because, like, counter plan theory is its whole own beast. But um, in general, I would expect... One very common avenue of answer to counterplans is you might raise a theory objection to. You might say, this version of counterplan is unfair. Um, probably the most common example of this is there's a question of conditionality versus unconditionality. Who's heard these terms before? Some of y'all? Okay. So this refers to whether or not the negative is tied to defending their advocacy. Theoretically, the negative could say something like this. You know, in the, in the NC, they say, hey, here's a proposal. It can fix the affirmative case, maybe. And then the app says, actually, it wouldn't fix the affirmative case. And then he's like, all right, we won't do that then. Um, you know, scratch that living wage idea. I don't want to defend that. Um, if some of you all saw the Jack versus Nina demo debate, you know, that's what Nina does. She's like, all right, you're right, the negative, uh, the, sorry, not the negative income tax, the living wage counterplan, it was a bad idea. I'm not going to defend that. And so she says, yeah, that counterplan is wrong. But remember, the center of the debate is not the counterplan, it's the resolution. So Nina could conceivably consider counterplan as a bad idea and still do the resolution through other means. She can say, all right, don't do that. Let's just stick with the status quo. But the status quo is still better than a universal basic income. And so one theory question is whether that's a legitimate thing for the negative to do. Logically, you know, it can make sense that the negative chooses not to defend that counterplan kind of anymore and prove the resolution through different means. But the AF often objects that that's unfair. The AF has one consistent advocacy throughout the debate round, which is the resolution. So it's unfair for the negative to just like pick one advocacy and then move to different advocacy and so on. Much like it's unfair for the negative to uh, you know, pick one argument and make brand new arguments in the NR, that even if theoretically it's logical to have a bunch of different possibilities and throw them all out, that there should be some sort of reciprocity where the app gets one advocacy, so the negative should be uh, stuck to one advocacy. And so that's the debate between conditionality and unconditionality. The app argument is unconditionality. You're going to want to say the, app, the negative should have an unconditional advocacy. So if you pick a counterplan, you've got to stick with that counterplan. If you don't pick a counterplan, you stick with the status quo. And conditionality is the negative argument, which is I should be able to pick and choose, and maybe I choose a counterplan, maybe I choose not to go for it. So that's one of the many theory issues that you might see related to uh, counterplans. Who has the time? It's 8 o'clock in the back, but I'm not sure it's accurate. 52. All right. Um, we've got to go in a few minutes. So you don't have any questions about plans or counterplans that have come up at any point? Yeah, so opportunity cost. This isn't a debate jargon word. This is actually a, a term that you'll see in economics and in other contexts. And opportunity cost is the reason not to do something is simply that you pass up on something else. And so the opportunity cost is just what's the next best thing that I could have done? Imagine that um, I have a bunch of options and all of them kind of suck. Well, I might end up choosing a bad option just because all the other options are worse. But if a really good option comes along, and it's even better than that, I'm no longer going to do that thing. You know, say going to McDonald's. McDonald's might have been exactly the same as before. The McDonald's didn't change it at all. But if a brand new restaurant I like better opens up, now there's a big opportunity cost to go into McDonald's, which is that I could go to that other restaurant instead. So at its heart, an opportunity cost is just, the cost of something is just the opportunity you're missing out on. So what's the next best opportunity? And in a debate round, the opportunity cost is going to be the counterplan. The app is missing out on doing this other thing. Other questions? Wait, what are the different types of counterplans? Oh, there's a bunch. Yeah. So, uh, to give a very brief rundown, you have advantage counterplans, which are counterplans whose strategic function is pretty much exclusively to try to fix an app advantage. So, if the app has an advantage about poverty, you have a counterplan who, that just fixes poverty. Um, there's plan inclusive counterplans, which are ones that include a portion of the affirmative plan. So you say, I agree with parts of the affirmative, but there's something that you included that's bad, we should exclude that portion of it. And so a plan inclusive counterplan includes most, but not all of the plan or the app advocacy. Obviously, if you included all of it, you'd be affirming the resolution. Um, 
There are agent counter plans or actor counter plans. I'm really not a fan of these. I think these are ones with a very strong theoretical objection to them. Um, but basically, that would be one where you say a different agent should take the same action uh, as the resolution. Uh, there are process counter plans, which would just change the process of the affirmative. On this topic, that probably looks like access fund the UBI versus one means. The negative says fund it through a different means. Those are pretty similar uh, to plan inclusive counter plans. Um, there's a lot of specific cheating counter plans. Like the delay counter plan is a classic uh, cliche one where you say, that's a good idea, but we can't do it right now. Let's you know, delay it a little while and do it like a month or two months down the road. This is commonly paired with an argument called the politics disadvantage where you say, if we did it right now, it would be really politically controversial and upset some other important political process. So let's wait until we get that resolved first. That's an example of one. There's a ton of them. Um, and probably varies from topic to topic which ones are strategic or not. Yeah. So uh, let's say you've got a decision to make. You could stay up um, really late choosing to uh, do X research. And there's a benefit to that, which is you're going to have a much better case. But there's costs to that. You know, you're going to miss out on sleep. You're going to miss out on, um, I guess, the ability to pay attention the next day because you're going to be tired. Um, maybe you're going to be really bored and it's unenjoyable. There's also costs in terms of maybe there's other things you can do with your time. Maybe there's nothing intrinsically wrong with research, but your friend just invited you to play a game. And it's like a game you really like, and you want to go do that instead. And so the cost to staying up and doing research is just, well, I miss out on the opportunity to go hang out with my friends. And so in addition to the costs that are sort of intrinsic to the thing that you're doing, so like, I get really tired, I can't pay attention, I'm really bored, there's also the cost of, what am I missing out on? Maybe the next best opportunity is sleeping more. Maybe the next best opportunity is going to hang out with friends. And bear in mind that, kind of in a sense, all the costs that you're talking about are going to be relative to which opportunities you're comparing them to. Because if your problem with staying up was, I'm going to get really sleepy and not pay attention the next day. If your choice is not, let's go to sleep now, but let's go hang out with friends now, you're going to have that exact same problem. And so it's always, it's always important to choose what the advocacy is or to have in mind what you're comparing it to, because that's going to affect which costs are relevant. Getting really tired and uh, falling asleep in lab tomorrow is going to be something that happens whether you stay up to hang out with friends or stay up to cut carbs. Um, and so it's also why I think, I see a lot of people sometimes just be like, I'm not defending anything, I'm just negating the resolution. And I think this kind of dem demonstrates why it's really hard or impossible to do that just in the abstract. How do you negate something with no conception of what you're comparing it to? Maybe the app advocacy is terrible, but if everything else is even worse, you should still do that. So you can't just like point out a cost to the app just purely in the abstract and say, therefore negate. There has to be something better. Usually by default, if you don't have an alternative advocacy, you haven't presented a counter plan, I think the assumption is you're defending the status quo. You're saying, let's just not change anything. And so what you at least need to do is show the cost to the affirmative is something that's not happening right now. But it doesn't make sense to just be like, well, there's a cost to the affirmative, which is like, UBI doesn't solve cancer. Well, yeah, because nothing's going to fix that, right? That's not a cost that you can solve. And so it's not a reason not to do the affirmative case. And so you always need to consider what are the costs relative to some other opportunity available to you. And that's why, even if you don't choose to read a counter plan or don't choose to explicitly state an advocacy, implicitly at least, you are defending assumption, something, or you need to be defending something. You need to be saying, well, the affirmative is bad, so let's just not do anything. Let's continue doing what we're doing. And so that's something I think to be cognizant of. Other questions? I think it's pretty close to the time right now. Am I right about that? Yeah. All right. We'll just miss you. Talking to lunch.